Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Shakira Grant. I'm an eighth generation black loyalist descendant from Nova Scotia, um, and I'm the founder of the Weymouth Falls Community Land Trust. Um, <laughs> so like all, everyone on this stage, our goal is to preserve and protect historic land uh, for our communities. And we're so fortunate to have ver four very incredible speakers with us today. Um, so I think the way that I'll, I'll do it, maybe I'll um, introduce our speaker and then let them present and, and go with that pattern instead of doing them all up front. And so our first speaker today is Caitlin Lucas, who is a Métis woman uh, who has been working within the Indigenous community over the past 20 years with a strong focus on homelessness and vulnerable populations. Caitlin has engaged on many levels from frontline to leadership. At present, she is the executive director of the Elizabeth Fry Society of Calgary and chair of the Aboriginal Standing Committee on Housing and Homelessness. Caitlin's strength is in, is in analyzing and restructuring programming to align within a cultural competent framework. Additionally, she designs evaluation tools and processes to enhance the outcome potential of programming and services. Caitlin is currently working with elders and knowledge keepers, the City of Calgary, United Way of Calgary, and other community partners on the development of an urban indigenous community land trust model. So please give a hand for Caitlin. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really uh, grateful to be here, and uh, it's an honor to be able to speak to you all today. Um, I'm from Calgary, and the work that we're doing right now it was. Uh, sorry, I'm looking for the um, next slide. <laughs> Didn't do the equipment check first, sorry. So I'll talk a little bit about the origin of the, the project. Uh, originally, we began a collaboration and conversation around the creative opportunities to increase Indigenous housing in, in Calgary. Um, in Calgary, being a city of over 1.6 million, there is only about 300 units specifically for Indigenous peoples, and we've been behind many of the other major cities in developing that housing. So we had these conversations with Home Space, which was the original uh, CLT in Calgary. It was called the Calgary Land Trust and it was established by a man named Brian O'Leary. His son is also someone probably known to the community, Colin O'Leary, who's uh, been working on the tax reform. Um, so in that terms they started the, the CLT but it didn't really work out that well because of land donations and the tax issue. And so they moved and transformed into working with uh, community organizations in permanent supportive housing, more under the homeless sector. However, um, with their expertise and then also having the City of Calgary um, Housing Solutions in the Indigenous Relations Office is backing our project along with one of our major funders, the United Way of Calgary, and then working with a, an Indigenous organization, Miskanawa, and then our work as the Aboriginal Standing Committee, we are just a committee, so we're just there to support the development. So Ash and Miskanawa, we're providing the Indigenous lens and the community connections through elders and Indigenous community. And United Way as a funder is hopefully going to provide future opportunities to link us up to corporate sector funders as well. So this partnership was really developed to leverage expertise advance existing resources and enhance the land trust perspective through an indigenous lens. And our goal really is to commence a model at this point. We're very in the early stages of our development and uh, our goal is to identify the stakeholders who will drive the model forward after we've completed the project. So our vision is that we began with elders and we began to, um, to identify just the concept of the land from an indigenous worldview and what it means to us as Indigenous people. And in contrast, how this view is contrary to the Western view of land ownership. And that was a very interesting conversation, which actually transformed some of our, our beginning uh, research on this project. 
So then we moved into the concept of the view of the land, and it moved us from looking at this project um, from a land uh, placed basis rather than a building uh, placed version. And so what we identified early on is that we didn't really want to start with the buildings and what that would look like, but to start with the land. And so we elicited a relationship and partnership with the land design students of the University of Calgary. And that helped us to build out um, the, the land trust more effectively. And really the benefits to that approach was that we began to identify how to implement the land trust into where land stewardship, uh, culture and connection will be embedded into the design. Uh, one of the major successes that we had is, um, with the Urban Indigenous Community Land Trust is it was validated by our mayor and council. So in June, we were able to get um, the Urban Community Land Trust embedded into our Indigenous uh, housing strategy through the, the city of Calgary. And in that place, we're going to be able to get um, a, an allotment of land, one a year without uh, payment, as well as we're going to be able to have them help leverage resources to move along the community land trust for us once we implement the partnership. So this was a very big feather in our cap uh, to move that forward as uh, you, we've heard all morning how important it is to have a uh, municipality on board. One of the major obstacles for the development of this project was the term community land trust. And that concept of the land trust together was initially very uncomfortable for our elders really due to that historical um, experiences of land and colonialism. So as such, it really took some time to get their desire to want to engage in the project and uh, direct the concepts more openly with us. So after we got through this discomfort, uh, the elders' main goal was to ensure that the land trusts will meet the cultural perspectives of uh, stewardship, governance, as well as establish how reclamation of both the physical land and the spirit of the land will be achieved. So as you can see, I'm probably not right in the right spot of Calgary. I've just sort of bullet pointed it, but it's around there. Um, as we've not begin, uh, begun our CLT yet, uh, the concept is to really utilize one or more of the land designs that those students developed for us to commence our project. So this may include land requiring reclamation, such as rebuilding over a previous quarry, or regaining uh, green spaces such as a, a closed golf course, or repurposing land such as the assuming a seven acre land previously used as an elementary school in the inner city. So at this point, we're still in the process. We're hoping to have our project uh, model wrapped up by the end of March. And so our next steps are uh, completing a policy review of city zoning bylaws and land acquisition. And it's being conducted to establish how we're gonna implement um, an indigenous this through an indigenous lens, including understanding the traditional and historical land spaces. Uh, one of our elders talked a little bit about one of the golf courses years ago being built upon teepee circles of the Blackfoot people. And in terms of that, you know, the land reclamation is such an important part of the city making that rec reconciliatory um, efforts to come back and address those discrepancies. We were additionally conducting a community engagement on October 25th, so we're gonna work with community and elders to just flesh out a little bit more on the design, the model, and governance uh, from a community perspective. And then in fin finality, we will finalize this project next year and do it with the elders and conduct a validation ceremony in a Blackfoot tea ceremony, and that will allow us to move forward in the next steps. So thank you. <laughs> was fantastic. I think something that stuck out for me with the presentation was when you were talking about, you know, how the Indigenous elders were a little hesitant about the land trust model, and I think it's really important for all of us to keep in mind that, you know, land ownership is a, is a colonial structure, so how do we engage with that, know that, but still be able to move forward and work with our Indigenous communities uh, in our land trust? So thank you for bringing that into the conversation. So next we have a fellow Nova Scotian. Uh, Curtis Wiley is a sixth generation African Nova Scotian from the historical community of Upper Hammonds Plains. He has worked with the province of Nova Scotia in various roles with Housing Nova Scotia and the Land Titles Initiative. 
As a volunteer with support from community, Curtis founded the Upper Hammonds Plains Community Land Trust. <laughs> yeah. Uh, through the trust, they are engaging, educating, and empowering community and partners to recognize the benefits of a community land trust as a mechanism to preserve historic land and facilitate community transformation. And they are definitely leading the way in our province in terms of community land trust. Hello everyone. I always have this issue where I have to bend way down to talk at things. Um, yeah, that might be helpful. All right. Um, all right. All right. Yes. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, so thanks everyone. I'm here today to tell you a little bit about my work in Upper Hammonds Plains. This is the community where I'm from. Um, so I want to start by acknowledging that. You know, the work that I carry out is in Mi'kma'ki, um, which is the home of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, and it's the ancestral territory of theirs. It's unceded. Um, and it's covered by the treaties of peace and friendship. And in Nova Scotia, we also acknowledge um, that people of African descent have been living in that province for over 400 years. And we honor and offer gratitude to our ancestors who came before us to this place. And we actually have our uh, flag um, that was, in the last few years, created. Uh, all part of us, you know, really defining ourselves as distinct people um, in Canada. So today I'm going to talk about the origins of black people in Canada um, and our existence, creation of um, this community in Nova Scotia in particular. I'll talk about the vision and the mission, some of the activities that we've been doing, and I'll close with um, an overview of kind of the precarious land situation that we find ourselves in um, and our way of addressing that. So I start by talking, a lot. when I'm in new spaces, I want people to understand the rootedness that African Nova Scotians have in, in Nova Scotia in particular. Um, and it evolves around our arrival. Um, so um, my ancestors were refugees from the War of 1812. Essentially, you know, um, the first uh, black person in Canada was Matthew de Costa in 1608. Um, and since then, there's been waves of settlement, primarily beginning in the late 1700s, but also into the early 1800s. Um, and during that time, black people came to, from Jamaica, from the Caribbean, um, from the southern U.S., and they settled in various places in Nova Scotia. Um, and so for my ancestors in particular, they were promised land in exchange for fighting in the war. And then when they got to Upper Hammonds Plains, or when they got to Nova Scotia, you know, they were sent to these various areas around our province. And that's what's created what, are, what we define as historical African Nova Scotian communities. There are 52 of them um, in, in Nova Scotia. And it's that geography and that place that I think sets the stage for CLTs to be very transformational in Nova Scotia. And so in Upper Hammonds Plains, you'll see the first photo is the mills on Pockwalk. My family, that's, so when my ancestors got there, these are rich, mature forests. Timbering was the primary industry, and my great-great-great-grandfather was a cooper. Um, so they started to manufacture barrels, and that industry boomed in Upper Hammonds Plains. Um, for for a century, or so that business is over 200 years old. It's still the some of the buildings are still there. Um, and then we had our own one-room schoolhouse. There was segregation in in the area, so uh, children could not go to the white school in Lower Hammonds Plains. So we had to build our own. Um, and our community center is actually built around that one-room schoolhouse. That that room is still within our community center. Um, and then we had to build our own volunteer fire department. It is the first all-black volunteer fire department in Canada. 
Um, and that was because, you know, there was all of these fires happening in our community and we couldn't actually extinguish them. They weren't being extinguished in time. Um, so these are some of the historical challenges. You know, land ownership is another one because when, they, you know, there was promise of land, but then when our ancestors got there, the conveyance of those titles never was actualized in a lot of situations. And I'll touch on that a bit. So dispossession of land um, for my ancestors has destroyed, you know, generations of what could have been, um, you know, legacy wealth for families. Um, and so it really starts all the way back to this. Well, these, I should say, there are many of them, but this one in particular has my great, great grandfather's name on it. His name was Dio Wiley. I don't know if I can if you can see my mouse, but that's his name right there from a document from 1834. And that along, so that's what gives us a sense of rootedness, right? Like we are trying to actualize real situations that our ancestors face that are documented, which is rare, right? Um, so this is what kind of drives us ahead. And so the land grants is one thing, <laughs> you know, the land expropriation is another. Land was expropriated in Upper Hammonds Plains in 1974 to build a water treatment facility. And they took a portion of the land and this, this lake was really sacred. You saw the mills that were on it. It was also a baptismal place. Um, and so they erected these large steel gates and restricted access to that site beginning then. The biggest atrocity of it is that, you know, that water that ran through our backyards did so for 25 years with Odas having access to it. Um, and we had to fight the city through a class action lawsuit in order to get access to the clean drinking water that literally, quite literally, ran through our backyards. And then it's tax sales. So tax, you know, municipal tax sales is the reason, and Shakira can attest to this because it's happening in all, and especially in her community, but in many others, is that that is how a lot of land is lost in our communities. So how are we gonna combat some of these issues? Well, for us, it was but the founding of Upper Hammonds Plains Community Land Trust. This is a photo of Upper Hammonds Plains. Um, to give you an idea of what it looks like, it's a beautiful place. Um, this is kind of at the top of the hill, so you can see kind of what it looks like. But this is you know, our founding vision and our purpose. And really it's about the protection and preservation of historical lands and the facilitation of community-led transformation through the leveraging of those assets. Um, that is precisely what we're focused on. Um, and our, our work is rooted again in that history. So I'm going to give a separate session um, tomorrow where I'll go into the depths of how we're tracing the titles and asserting interests based on those that history. But I wanted people to get, have an understanding um, of what we, what we were doing. And so this was all kind of came about, came to a head based on development in Upper Hammonds Plains. Um, and I'll just quickly, well, I'll get, the, I'll get to the development, I'm sorry. Um, so what are we doing? This is our vision and our purpose. So, you know, Upper Hammonds Plains Community Land Trust was founded in February 2022. So it's, it's a new entity, um, but we've been working on, in this space for a few years. Well, the first thing, you know, I, we founded this trust and we said, oh, we're going to build housing and we're going to just immediately start this practice. But that isn't what actually happened. Um, the first activity that we were thrown into was rezoning of our community. The community was zoned, like, essentially we had open, more open zoning, res less restrictions. So that was put in place to benefit community at one time. Never thinking that you know it would get to it would end up being leveraged by developers to build as of right development, and that's precisely what happened. Um, so we did re successfully rezone the community as quickly as we could, and that was done in two years, which was essentially unprecedented because usually that practice takes some time. But there was a lot of advocacy. You can see that we filled city hall um, for the voting, and it was an, an also an, a historical moment um, where the mayor had never seen a community come out for this type of activity ever. And there's children there and ever seniors, everything. Um, so we're doing that. We've done. A, we've worked on our. Um, strategic plan, we've created that. We've done reconciliatory relationships. When I talked about those gates at the Melvin, at, sorry, at the, um, at the watershed, those gates have been there. We have driven past them for 30 years, 30 years, over 30 years, and we've never been through them. Um, and part of the work of the trust, we sent a letter to Halifax Water and started a conversation. And you know, it's interesting to find out that they really didn't even know the history of the expropriation, you know, that had happened before many of the leaders were even there. 
Um, and so it was a momentous day when we got to go through those gates and stand on the water. Look, see, I had never seen Pacwak Lake in my life. Huge lake, right? Um, and it was a very powerful moment. Um, so those are the types of things that we're doing. Um, and those are the things that I believe are heading us in the right pathway um, in terms of reconciling. Um, we're also doing research on acquisition and acquisition mapping and bylaw development. <laughs> just to, just for a little side piece, yeah. Um, so setting the context, this is the last slide, but I think it's important for people to understand, and this is kind of what I'm going to talk a little bit more b about tomorrow in more detail. But this is a map of Upper Hammonds Plains, and Upper Hammonds Plains is defined by this road. It's called the Pockwalk Road, and it runs directly through our community this way, right? So this is Pockwalk Lake up here. You can only see the tip of it. Um, and this is where the plant is, and this is essentially the expropriation, and I have a transmission line. You can see this long piece of thing here, which that restricts us. This is our property, this big Melvin. This is actually community-owned property. Yeah, it is, it's an amazing thing. And, it, and I, but you know, we can't, there's so many restrictions. You see that hashing that's over top of it? That's because it's in a, a, a watershed protection zone, number one. And number two, there's physical barriers that prevent us from even getting to it, right? I've never set foot on it until a couple weeks ago when they let us through the gates to see that, right? So there's barriers to being, and we thought we were just gonna be able to develop houses on this, right? So this is what the Community Land Trust has been able to start us unfolding, right? We can't do this, we need to reconcile, we need to do all these things, but we're doing it. Um, and then Little Melvin's another little piece of the Melvin Land Tract. I kind of skipped over that piece, but the Melvin Land Tract is a historical piece of communally owned property um, in our community, which is really unique, right? It was granted to the community in 1855 for forestry. Um, but there's restrictions, it's hard to get to it. There's a whole bunch of barriers to getting to it, which is why we have our eyes on something else in the community. But so you can see, um, that 38% of the lands in Upper Hammonds Plains now belong to the community versus 100%, right? That's a, big, that's a big piece, and so our trust is going to work to change that number. Um, through expropriation, our largest parcel is inaccessible. There's 463 acres of land that remain in precarious title situations, and those are highlighted kind of here. You can see these different other colored parcels. These ones here, you can see are the uniform shape that would have been granted to people, like 40 acres and a mule, these are them. They're still there, right? But they don't have any type, they don't belong to anybody. They're just sitting there and they've been underutilized. They, people haven't been able to possess them um, for over 200 years. And so the community land trust is asserting interest in these properties. That is what we're going to be doing because it's, it's gonna be impossible. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, and so that is what we're doing. And these parcels at the top that you see are purple, that are right along, they have frontage on a public street. They're prime for development. There's also a significant amount of development happening around there. It's like 745 units. There's a lot of development happening in our community. Um, anyhow, they, those are the ones that I'll talk about. And up, up until last year, they were what's called owner unknown, which again is a precarious title situation, but they got taken by the Crown, which meant they were subject to the Crown Lands Act, which meant that we could make an assertion on them. And that's what we did, and I'm gonna investigate that with everyone tomorrow. But that's where I wanted to leave it. Um, and I hope that that gives everyone a better understanding of us. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis. That was such a great presentation. Um, something I want to add, because obviously the presentations are condensed, that when I've seen Curtis present before, um, he shows this photo of Upper Hammonds Plains. That's it's just it's one road because a lot of the Black communities are like that. Weymouth Falls is like that because there was no planning done for these communities. They just give us one road and then figure the rest out yourself. Um, and so, along with the land trust. Um, Upper Hammonds Plains Community Land Trust had been advocating about safety, and, and if we have general use zoning, that means people can do whatever they want in our communities. And so there was a situation in Upper Hammonds Plains where they had two residential homes in between two, is it salvage car lots? Right. Salvage car lots. Um, both of those homes have kids, and so there's cars coming in, salvage cars coming in, all hours of the night, disrupting the families, and they've said this is a safety issue for how long? A decade? <laughs> Um, and so three weeks ago, there actually was an incident at one of the car lots. I'll just start by saying the homes are safe, um, but there was a massive fire and one of them completely burned down. 
And again, because it's only one road in, one road out, the people in that community were stranded because these car lots are at the beginning of the street. And so these are the other things. Of course, housing and all these things are so important, but when you have ag advocacy, especially from racial uh, like equity-seeking groups, it's more than just developing housing. It's, it's actually about our own safety. So I just want to throw that out there because they've done a lot of great work. All right, so next we will have Lydia Lowe presenting. Uh, so Lydia is the executive director of the Chinatown Community Land Trust, which works to stabilize Boston Chinatown through community control of land development without displacement and collective governance of shared resources. This includes preservation of permanently affordable resident controlled housing, planning for a Chinatown historic and cultural district, district sorry, energy resilience work and open space improvement. She spent three decades doing grassroots organizing and building the Chinese Progressive Association prior to co-founding the Chinatown Community Land Trust with other longtime activists and residents. She also serves on the Chinatown Master Plan Committee, the Greater Boston Community Land Trust Network, Massachusetts Environmental Justice Advisory Commission, and the City, the city of Boston's 250th Anniversary Commemoration Commission. So let's welcome Lydia. Thank you. Um, so I come from Boston, the territory of the Massachusetts people. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Boston Chinatown. And I want to start by putting um, Chinatown's history also in a bit of a historic context. Um, our Chinatowns grew up in an atmosphere in which laws and policies were passed by our government uh, deliberately to prevent us from entering, uh, remaining, or thriving. Um, people probably had heard that the Chinese first came to the US during the gold rush in California. Right away, we were there were laws to prevent uh, people of color like the Chinese from mining. Uh, by the 1870s, 1880s, the Chinese had reclaimed tens of thousands of um, acres of land for agriculture and were 75% of the agricultural labor uh, had also worked to build the, the Transcontinental Railroad and then um, the, we had the Chinese Exclusion Act. There were alien land laws, people know about redlining, so this is all the context also for Boston Chinatown, which started in the late 1860s the, the, as people fled the mob violence in the West uh, to come eastward, um, the first Chinese settled in Boston. But because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, the population really didn't grow significantly until after World War II because there was, the only way people could come in was through um, you know, sneaking through. But this is what uh, Chinatown looked like in the 1800s. So one of the first big um, modern day impacts on Chinatown was urban renewal and highway construction. Uh, the plan was, this, this was an area that already had a rail yard, uh, but the plan was basically to put two highways through uh, what is now Chinatown. And you can see what that, the impact. This was followed uh, after they removed thousands of families, <clears throat> took their homes, raised them, and, and built two highways through the community. The land that wasn't turned over to the highways then went to a hospital, the, new, the floating hospital. And if you look at the purple on the left-hand map or the blue on the upper 
uh, right hand corner that shows you the amount of land that was then taken over by those institutions. Uh, Tufts University and Tufts is today, it's called Tufts Medical Center. Almost half of the community land. Um, below you can see um, the other thing that happened during this period was that the city of Boston decided to zone an adult entertainment district right next to Chinatown as the only adult entertainment district in the city, um, causing the community you know, to live with that for decades. So these are some of the policies that really um, led to the destruction and demolition of the community. Uh, I think when we got to the 1990s, 2000, into the, the, 20, <laughs> the 21st century, what we've been facing is luxury development and economic displacement. In the last 20 years, we have, the Chinatown's housing stock has more than doubled, uh, pre predominantly because of luxury housing towers. So our fight is really to remain and our perspective as we started the Chinatown Community Land Trust is that we have a right to our historic community. Our communities began in the context of mob racial violence and exclusion. Um, despite that, people banded together and survived and we have a right to remain. So that's really what our Community Land Trust is all about. And as we think about that right to our historic community, it's caused us to think about um, what does it mean to have a healthy community? That there are many different aspects of life that we want to um, grow. And also, what is it that makes Chinatown, Chinatown? Uh, because there are so many aspects, our work has actually expanded in different directions. Of course, the most important thing is that we have to remain, that people have to be there. So permanently affordable housing is at the core but it also means that um, we have to fight for policies and for plans that will support our vision. We have increasingly, as we talk about what does it mean for Chinatown to be Chinatown, that we want to lift up and name Chinatown as a historic and cultural district, but we're defining that historic and cultural district as one which is characterized by the fact that this community has always been an anchor for the immigrant working class. And because, you know, of the immense, you know, climate threat to the world, we also need to work for environmental justice uh, in, in different ways. We've, a lot of our work has grown out of organizing. Our, our, the community land trust started because of um, activists like myself and others, we were frustrated with fighting development after development uh, and feeling that there was, every time we won something, it would get taken away from us. So we still feel that organizing is at the core of what we need to do to build power, but we see the community land trust as another tool that we can use to kind of try to hold on to some of the things that we've won. And we continue to work around a lot of policies. We're trying to get uh, rezoning of the community that would favor um, some of our goals. We're working for a tenant opportunity pr to purchase and we successfully got a short-term rental ordinance that regulates short-term rentals. We're just at the beginning of our work. We've uh, so far acquired three uh, row house properties, 11 units of permanently affordable housing. Our first two properties, um, our first seven units, thank you. <laughs> it's not a lot, but it's a lot of work. Um, the first seven units are um, permanently affordable condos um, because those were vacant buildings that we reclaimed from short-term rental use uh, that had been purchased by an investor. And our most recent property was an occupied rental property and um, we just acquired that this summer and we will be working with the tenants to see if they'd like to do a cooperative or rent to own situation. Because of defining Chinatown as a, as a historic and cultural district, we've become increasingly involved in, in work around that cultural definition and uh, one of, part of what we're doing to lift up our characterization of this history and culture is an immigrant history trail in which we're marking different spots around Chinatown um, 
uh, and you know, with a QR code so that people can hear stories. We're also working with an artist on placing bronze statues of immigrant workers in four sites around Chinatown. Uh, one of our most challenging and interesting projects is a microgrid, which is community-led and in the future we hope will be community-owned. We're, we're currently in a partnership. Uh, we are basically um, installing, doing energy efficiency work, installing solar and um, battery storage and enabling buildings. Mo our first phase is focused on multifamily affordable housing and the goal is to allow f buildings to power on and off the grid um, during peak energy use times as well as emergencies. And because Chinatown, due to all of that highway development, institutional expansion, it was never recognized as a residential neighborhood. It's a lot of, um, you know, it's kind of an asphalt jungle and therefore is the, one of the hottest places in the city of Boston, also has the worst air pollution in the state and is susceptible to flooding. Uh, because of that, we've been increasingly involved also in advocating for expansion and improvement of open space and green infrastructure. And these are just some of the projects that we're doing. Thank you. That was so great. It's really nice to see, you know, well, first of all, your organization is very far ahead. I think it's amazing to see the holistic approach that you've taken to community land trust. I think someone mentioned it earlier today, you know, we focus a lot on housing, but it's it's about creating, even those public spaces are so important to keep our community land trust going, especially when you talk about the historic significance. So thank you again. So our final presenter um, is Jacka Blaze, who uses she, her pronouns. Uh, Jacka is a seasoned bilingual social sector leader with 18 years of experience in philanthropy, government, and community mobilization. Jacka is a change agent to shift power dynamics and remove oppressive structures within philanthropic, philanthropic and nonprofit organizations. As a recognized thought leader on equity and philanthropy, I don't know why I'm struggling with that word, she focuses on contrib contributions, uh, improvements, ad advocates for marginalized voices and grassroots initiatives at decision-making tables. And Jack is the inaugural executive director of Hogan's Alley Society, a Vancouver-based nonprofit focused on advancing the social, political, economic, and cultural well-being of people of African descent through the delivery of inclusive housing, built spaces, and culturally performed programming. Jack is a founding member of the Foundation of Black Communities, the first philanthropic foundation for black communities in Canada. She is a board member with Philanthropic Foundations Canada and completed a fellowship with the Justice Funders Harmony Initiative. Jack is now a guest on the unceded and occupied ancestral lands of the Squamish, the Slay Watooth and the Musqueam Nations with her husband and two boys and enjoys traveling with them whenever possible. So please welcome Jacka. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, so I think it's really um, great to be following Lydia because um, Hogan's Alley, where we're located, we're actually right connected to Chinatown. Um, and a lot of what you describe in terms of the, the history and the impact of urban renewal um, was very similar to what happened in Hogan's Alley. So really happy to be here with you today and be able to share some of our um, uh, experiences uh, with Hogan's Alley Society. Uh, you shared our, our mission and um, it really is something that's uh, about the broader community beyond uh, the land trust aspect. Um, and also it's really important for us to recognize that, you know, we're operating on stolen and occupied territory of the Musqueam, Skohomish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. And so as uh, an organization, we're committed to working in solidarity with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples 
in the pursuit of decolonization and building a just society. Uh, part of what that's looking like for us right now is um, you know, engaging in um, lots of learning and authentic relationship building. Uh, we've recently been um, learning from the Skohomish Nation about um, the, the traditional uh, history of the land where Hogan's Alley is located um, and how uh, maple trees were a key uh, part of that community and um, the, the importance that that played for uh, the uh, Squamish Nation. No, nope, I went too fast, sorry. <laughs> Managing two clicking things, so. Um, so what is Hogan's Alley? Uh, so first of all, there is no um, person named Hogan. Uh, the term Hogan's Alley was actually like a derogatory term that was um, used to reference ultimately ghettos and um, you would see them across North America and it would be like the areas that um, uh, had uh, lost lots of people, um, you know, experiencing poverty or uh, coming from immigrant background, um, and people would reference to it as, "Oh, that's really a Hogan's Alley." So it, that term, um, often, you know, people will ask, like, "Where does that come from?" And our organization intentionally uh, chose uh, that name for our organization in a in a way to reclaim um, the the name. Uh, so Hogan's Alley was the unofficial name for a T-shaped intersection at the south uh, western edge of Strathcona neighborhood, which uh, is just adjacent to Chinatown. And it was a multicultural neighborhood, and it also formed the nucleus of Vancouver's first black community, um, which start, and black community members started arriving in the early 1900s. At its peak in around the 1940s, um, Hogan's Alley was home to more than 800 black community members. And we have those receipts from um, registry from the first black church that was established in Hogan's Alley and has a, a registry of all the, the community members there. There were several reasons why black community members um, clustered in this area, first of all being the prevalence of affordable housing at the time, uh, the proximity to railroads where many black men worked as sleeping car uh, porters, so you can see the image on the far edge. I don't know what side that is, my directions turned off. Um, as well as the restrictions that racialized people uh, experience from settling in other parts of Vancouver. So actually in Vancouver currently, we still have on title um, some um, properties which have a covenant saying that they're uh, not allowed to be sold to um, Chinese, First Nation, or black residents. And those, uh, it's not enforceable anymore, but they haven't been like removed from title. And our, um, so the community um, was also impacted by urban renewal and the, um, as well as a series of um, racist practices by uh, the municipal government. Um, and that urban renewal um, focus of bringing in a focus on car culture and building highways through black and brown neighborhoods across North America really ultimately led to the destruction of Hogan's Alley and the ultimate displacement of the black community members that um, had been there. Uh, so if you see the map that's up here in the corner, um, the orange lines, like that's the T intersection and what was referred to as Hogan's Alley. And now that is traversed by viaducts. Um, and the interesting story is that there was three different plans that they could have used when building those viaducts. One that went around that block and would have preserved the community. And of course they chose to go directly through the, the community. 
um, great good news out of that was that um, the plan was actually to continue the highway up into Chinatown and to which would have ultimately had a, a very negative impact on Chinatown and community members like rose up and um, protested that development and so that um, development was of that uh, extension of the highway was actually blocked, but the damage was already done when it came to Hogan's Alley. So when we talk about the displacement, the impact is uh, on you know people losing the physical structures, so homes, businesses. Um, there was multiple uh, businesses, restaurants that people had established, uh, but. What the biggest impact was the loss of the social bonds, the uh, political, cultural, and social capital that had been established in the community as people started uh, dispersing into other parts of the province, returning back to the United States, uh, or going to other parts of Canada. And um, decades later, we still don't have a, uh, a, a nucleus for the black community in Vancouver because of that displacement. So in 2015, the city of Vancouver began uh, consultations to inform the development of the Northeast Falls Creek plan, which was based on a decision to remove those viaducts that I'd mentioned. And it was gonna be um, uh, a big 20 year plan to redevelop the area. Um, and so, you can see um, the arrows are pointing to where Hogan's Alley falls, and that top corner is that blue um, or teal colored area is what's referred to as Northeast Falls Creek and what is, uh, was the um, focus of the plan. When the city started consultations, uh, there, they had a, a council meeting um, where they were sharing their lovely plans and thoughts for um, the area, and uh, black community members really showed up and stood up and called them out on the fact that they hadn't even mentioned that there was this black community that existed there. And so uh, they were really, the city was really taken aback, and they had to go back and uh, figure out what they were going to do. And so they established the um, Hogan's Alley Working Group and brought together community members um, to start informing the development of the Northeast Falls Creek plan. And so those community members um, were really a, instrumental in helping um, with the design of um, the Hogan's Alley block. And um, the Northeast Falls Creek plan actually won an award, this, the municipality won an award uh, because it was the first um, municipal plan that spoke explicitly to cultural redress. And so it uh, spoke to cultural redress for indigenous, Chinese, and black communities. Um, out of that process, the idea of having a community land trust came from community members. The initial conversations with the city were to establish a cultural center. And you know, people started saying like, we can't just have a cultural center isolated, surrounded uh, by like unaffordable, you know, living area. And also commu black community members often don't feel welcomed in spaces in Vancouver. And so you need the cultural center to be surrounded by areas where black community members are, are living and um, have businesses and so that it's more part of a community. So that's where the land trust came into play to really establish um, that uh, perpetual affordability for uh, the community. They established some guiding principles focused on recognition, honoring, access and inclusion, security of tenor, and our definition of land use as well as investment. And, um, oh, what did I do? Oh, okay, good, sorry. <laughs> um, and through the charrette process with the working group, there were some initial designs that were um, put into place for the development of the block. 
So Hogan's Alley Society, last year, we were able to announce that we signed an agreement with the city of Vancouver to um, be able to negotiate a long-term lease for the development of the Hogan's Alley block. So once they remove the viaducts, we will be able to develop that block um, and hold it within a community land trust that will protect affordability for the community. The development um, and this mandate was given by community um, in terms of developing a black cultural center, social housing, uh, space for small businesses and childcare spaces. And so this is kind of an early design of that block. Um, yeah, and as part of our land trust development, we're also interested at looking at acquiring other properties. We're just in the process of finalizing an acquisition that will actually be our first acquisition within our land trust, um, and that will allow us to deliver a significant amount of affordable housing for the community. So our organization, Hogan's Alley Society, also does um, work beyond the establishment of the land trust which includes uh, housing, research and advocacy, and community building and community care. Uh, so some highlights of that work is that we're in a partnership to operate Nora Hendricks Place, which is a 52-unit 52, temporary modular social housing development. It's located on the Hokins Alley block, and it prioritizes black and indigenous community members that are looking to exit homelessness. Um, our housing, our Hogan's Alley Housing Solutions Lab research project uh, is working to provide a deeper understanding of the challenges of black communities um, in Vancouver around accessing equitable housing. And then we're also working on convening the black community to support community building and really recreate Hogan's Alley as a hub for the black community. So that's it. Uh, that was incredible. All four of the presentations were incredible. I'm so happy to be here. Um, something I just want to say, you know, is when we talk about racial equity in CLTs or anything that has to do with, with racialized folks, um, it's, a, it's a very long journey. And so with Hogan's Alley's presentation just now, um, you spoke about how the municipality, you've, you've reached agreements, but there's going to be a lot of work that has to go on from there and a lot of advocacy that has to happen. So. You know, if, Hogan Alley, if Hogan's Alley ever needs support, I'm hopeful that we will all be there to support them. Um, I can say in Nova Scotia, we have a community, uh, Africville, that was um, completely displaced. Um, and a saying that we have in our community is, you know, if we all rallied around it, Africville would have never happened. And so I think this is an opportunity, like Jack has said, for um, our communities to have more space in these places. And we're all going to need to show up when it comes time. So make sure that you're taking out everyone's information. Um, I just want to pass to questions. I know we're tight on time, so I'm going to skip all of my questions. Um, so does anyone in the audience have, have questions for any of our pan panelists? I would just like to say that I loved all four of your presentations. Uh, it's really, really an honor and a privilege to see our BIPOC taking the lead in some amazing initiatives, and I'm really proud of all of you, and I love Caitlin, but I love you guys too. <laughs> just say it. But I love all of you, and I'm really, really proud. I, I just, to see what's going on in Boston was so inspiring to me, and so you kind of like, when I think of the Ninoaki Land Trust, I, I think of my friends over here and all of the great things that they're doing, and it's like, it's all just coming together and I, I guess I, one question I have for, for the panel is, how do you create collaboration and not competition? English. Thank, thanks for that question. Um, it's an important one. Um, I can speak to what, you know, in my own community. Um, one thing we did, because that's, a, that's an important thing uh, when we're talking about, I guess, you know, the black communities in Nova Scotia, because there are so many, um, they are defined, but, you know, within our communities, there can be contention, right, about which organization is going to take the lead, 
um, on some of these activities. And so what we did in Upper Hamas Plains is we actually went on a visioning retreat with you know, the, the Community Development Association, you know, the Cemetery Committee, everybody. Um, we have a bunch of small organizations and like we literally went through all of this stuff like okay What does each organization do? This is what you want to do like let's get all on the same page because there were times even when I was starting My work that I would be like upsetting this group over here, and I didn't want them. I wanted to have their support um, And so that was a really important piece And I think if getting on the same page with all of the kind of other organizations in your area is a really important thing to do if you have the space and the ability to do it Maybe because we're still pretty small, we haven't reached that point. Um, actually, I, but we have in, in Boston area, we have a Greater Boston Community Land Trust Network, um, which is made up of about eight or nine organizations working in different communities and neighborhoods. And it's just been a really important source of support and solidarity for all of us because we're all learning um, how to do this work most of us did not, you know, well, some people did go to planning school, but most of us didn't. Most of us came out of community organizing and, um, you know, didn't have a development background or, you know, a legal background or things like that that we need to learn. So um, we're just constantly working together to help each other. Um, and I hope that, you know, through that kind of um, building together and, and and because we're still a very small movement, also it's so important that we've come together, we've been able to win some victories on the policy area because of that. I think for us, it's about um, including community right from the beginning, and particularly our elders to guide the process. But in Calgary, there's only maybe six Indigenous organizations, seven, and only three of them are involved in housing and um, homelessness. So I think it's the, the passion to get more out there. Right now, um, there's probably 34 to 40% people in the uh, homeless serving system of care. And there is another probably um, 50 to 70%, depending on the sector, whether it's family or singles, uh, in homelessness. And then we've got 4.5% um, of the overall people that are involved in um, housing instability or indigenous people. So that's 4,000 out of 85,000 people that are in that situation, which is a lot when we're only 3% of the population in Calgary. So it's about that collaboration and the passion because of those issues that everyone wants to, to start seeing these things move forward. Uh, the only thing I would add is um, the impact of colonialism and white supremacy culture really leads to pitting us against each other. And so we've had to do some intentional work around relationship building and kind of really looking to, you know, redirect where our frustrations should be directed. Um, and that there are competing interests. And, you know, when it came to that block, there's lots of competing interests. Um, but ultimately, like, if we're, we're, if we're really going to succeed, we need to be doing this together. And we've, uh, for example, been... Um, as an organization working actively to build relationships with organizations in Chinatown. And um, one of the things is about um, trying to surface the, um, the, the ways that our community's histories intersected in the past, then thinking about how we can work together currently, and then planning for a collective vision in the future. Hi. Um, I have a question. Thank you so much for wonderful presentations and really rooting them in the journey of time of how they've gotten there. Um, I was wondering if you could speak about what your land trust relationship with the state is. And it's really interesting to hear at different moments whether like municipality gets awards for redress or uh, rethinking. How does that relationship with the state, where is it now? And is that an enabling uh, relationship? Or is that one of contestation still? That's a, that's a great question. Um, ours is definitely part of that reconciling uh, piece. Uh, you know, we, we started that rezoning activity and that started 
a process for us. It was rough at the very beginning, um, but I really feel like over those years we did gain, we did experience true allyship um, in a few of the people that were involved in that activity. Um, but you know, and then we were kind of on this pathway and wanting to get into long range planning and then all of a sudden everything stopped, right? So we was just, we'll just do the rezoning and we'll just leave it there. And we had been told that we would be able to start this other practice, so of course then we have to continue advocating, right? And on all that momentum that we had, um, it dissipates, right? So that was, that's one of the big frustrations. We're gonna get into that, that activity now, but the zoning was done last January. Um, so it's hard because we're trying to build these relationships, but the relationship, it's not, con you know, it's not on continuous and ongoing. Um, it still seems very piecemeal and transactional rather than, uh, you know, an authentic relationship, I think, being built, at least at our experience in our community. Uh, I just wanted to add, like, to the timeline. Um, it took about four years of negotiations with the city to enter into the Memorandum of Understanding, and that was done by our volunteer board members. Uh, so a lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into that. Um, and uh, I entered, I joined the organization last year, and I'll say that now when I have conversations with the municipality, there is actually a real openness to collaborate, but I know that that wasn't the experience even just two years ago, you know, like the, it, it was really hard fought relationship, um, and there's still work to do. I think it's also the, the political will. You gotta move fast when there's a good government in. Currently we have a municipal government that's really open, so they did approve that uh, relationship under the indigenous strategy. But we also have a provincial government that took $1.2 billion from affordable housing down to 287 million. So, and capital housing for indigenous projects went from 120 million down to 32 million. So, we aren't getting anything from the province or selling all the, the housing stock off in Alberta, but the um, federal government just recently, for example, put the municipalities on, on the chopping block saying, you know, uh, open up your rezoning or we're not gonna flow down the, the, the cash for these projects. So I think you have to really leverage um, the governments when they're open to this because it can change at any time. I think we've had a lot of support at our local municipal level, but um, it kind of stops there. <laughs> and the, for the most part, the whole, I, what I, I, I'm really inspired by the conversations in Canada because compared to what we see, um, there's just, the only conversation is new construction, new construction, new construction all the time. If, if people talk about affordable housing at all. So um, I think we're really just at the very beginning. It was two years ago we got the first allocation of $2 million for a community land trust fund in Boston, um, which is not very much money, but we used it to seed a shared loan fund. Um, but then the city officials, then when we go to apply for other programs for a subsidy as we're trying to acquire property, they keep saying, didn't, but didn't we give you the CLT fund? Or why can't you use that? So. Okay. Uh, okay, we are at time, but we'll take one more question. People are pointing at you, so you must have a really good question. It's nice to, to see everyone in person. I've been having some chats with some of the folks on stage. Um, yeah, I'm wondering, like, given the context of, you know, big cities uh, in Canada uh, that are seeing rapid waves of immigration, you know, diverse diasporic communities that are emerging and, and growing as well, what does true allyship look like for these communities with your own? Um, like, like with your own communities that have been here for generations. So, what would, what would true allyship look like for, 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 for like people like me, for others that, 
you know, want to help and support, but also would like, you know, to be welcomed in as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I hear you. And it's, a, and it's a complex question, I think, for us in particular. I think one thing that we've been talking about is a, because we have such limited capacity, our organizations, for the most part in, in Nova Scotia, are completely volunteer. Uh, we don't have anybody um, working inside any of our black-led community housing organizations aside from one organization. Um, we are all having to work and then do build these organizations on our own. Um, or on our on our own personal time, so I think it's I think it's about holding space, right? When pe when people can hold space for me, I can show up there. But for me to arrange the space is a lot is a, often a, a large burden. Um, so I think that's one thing um, that that would be an easier way for me to get involved. And in, and people, you know, often I want to be able to share more information, but it takes so much time to be able to you know, get back to people and arrange meetings and all of those things. It's just such a heavy administrative burden. So I think any barriers that you can remove to connecting with someone um, and, and holding, um, hosting a space for them to arrive at uh, would be helpful. That's a whole, that's a whole workshop. <laughs> so I'm not gonna. <laughs> Um, I, th uh, I think actually that um, there is a real role to play in using your voice to help advocate for the change that these different communities are trying to make. And so, um, and I think we each, we know when you were talking about collaboration, I think we each have a role to play to help advocate for each other as well because we're all in different spaces we also have a role to play in helping educate our own communities about what's going on in other communities um, helping transform some of the narratives and really helping to strengthen relationships Now it's working, okay, great. Um, yeah, so that concludes our panel. Um, can we give a round of applause to our amazing panelists? Yeah, I think j just in closing, you know, this morning I believe it was Nat who started and, and said, you know, part of, the, part of what's happening in Canada are, is around defining what is a CLT and what isn't a CLT. And so I think what is interesting is some of the common themes that came from everyone, which is preserving the history. And, and um, I, I think it was Lydia who said, you know, we have a right to, to our history and we have a right to our communities. And so I hope that resonates with you folks as we, as we move forward. Um, but yeah, thank you all again so much. Can I have, just, thank you. I just wanted to take a moment because I have a mic and I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge this beautiful human being here because Curtis, I met you just a year ago, last that, um, and the way you've shown up for community and your, the leadership that you've shown and the way you're just like always giving, um, I just wanted to take a moment and acknowledge that in a public space.